So as you know, tonight's topic is on homosexuality, and we have two speakers to speak on this issue. One is Garrett Johnson, who came back to the Catholic faith six years ago after, living, after years of living a godless lifestyle for most of his adult life. He joined Courage in 2013 and is now a member of the Washington, Baltimore, and Arlington Courage communities. He shares his journey with many through his website, brotherwithoutorder.com, has spoken to many Courage-related events, including the 2016 Courage Conference, and has appeared on EWTN. He lives here in Washington, where he is a stylist and salon manager. We're also very happy to have Father Paul Scalia with us on this Feast of St. John Vianney. He's the patron saint of diocesan priests, and we actually have a relic of St. John Vianney in our altar. And so Father Paul Scalia studied theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University and the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. That's the Angelicum, our Dominican school in Rome. He was ordained in 1996 and currently serves as the vicar for clergy in the Diocese of Arlington and pastor of St. James Parish in Falls Church. He has written for various publications and is a frequent speaker on matters of faith and doctrine. Father Scalia is the author of That Nothing May Be Lost, Reflections on Catholic Doctrine and Devotion, and Sermons in Times of Crisis, 12 Homilies to Stir Your Soul, from St. Benedict Press. So please welcome uh, Garrett and Father Scalia. There we go. Thank you, uh, Father Hyacinth, and all those here at St. Dominic's responsible for putting this series of lectures together. My understanding of the church's teaching in regards to human sexuality has grown as a result of what you've done here, so thank you. I also thank you for inviting Father Scalia and I to speak this evening on a topic that makes many people uncomfortable and confuses many, homosexuality, or more accurately, same-sex attraction. I'm here to share my testimony as someone who has experienced same-sex attraction for the greater portion of my life and has found freedom and peace in the truth found in the Holy Catholic Church. My goal here is to share my experience with you. I ask, as a good friend of mine asks in the movie Desire of the Everlasting Hills, that you be open to the idea that what I'm sharing with you is true for me and that it might be true for someone else as well. The movie, along with another DVD set, is available on the back table for free, so please feel free to take a copy for yourself, a friend, or your pastor. While trying to prepare for this talk over the last few weeks, I found myself distracted, or at least that's how I viewed what was keeping me from preparing. A few nights ago, I planned on getting the opening and closing of this talk written. I went out to dinner with some friends, then I spoke to a friend on the phone. When I got off the phone with him to get work done on the writing, another friend called. By the time we finished, it was time for bed, and I thought to myself, I'm never going to get anything written with all these distractions. Within a few seconds of that thought, the realization came to me that these friends are not distractions. These are relationships, relationships with men, something that has been a challenge for me most of my adult life. These relationships are one of the tools in God's hands through which he is erasing the lies that have blinded me to the truth of who I am for most of my life. I'd like to share an image I saw in my heart one day recently while at adoration. What I saw was God leaning close to my mother's distended belly, whispering to me inside her, you are my beloved son, I love you. With these words, he was writing my identity as I was formed in her womb. He wrote, he write, he wrote on my soul as he writes on all of our souls. He etched my identity into me, knowing that the enemy would begin overwriting the truth of who I am as soon as I was out. The lies the enemy wrote through bullying, our warped culture, psychology, and misinformation about Christ would blind me to the truth of who I am for many years. The lies started early on. In kindergarten or in first grade, I was hanging up my coat in the coat room or getting it out, and one of the kids loudly called me gay. 
Uh, my ears felt like they were on fire. I looked around to see if anyone was looking at me or if anyone was paying attention. No one said anything to defend me. No one corrected the person who said this to me. And I certainly did not tell anyone in authority at school or at home. I felt shame even though I didn't really know what the word gay meant. I certainly knew it wasn't good. The lie went unchallenged and the word gay was written on my soul. Another day in elementary school, a teacher in front of the whole class decided to tell me what a beautiful woman I would be. This time I felt shame, but also a bit of joy, as this sounded like a compliment to me. Beautiful couldn't be bad, I thought. No one corrected the teacher, and I once again said nothing to anyone in authority or at home. The lie went unchallenged, and the word woman was written on my soul. All throughout my childhood, I felt different from other kids. Gay wasn't something I knew about. What I did know was that I wanted to be as close as possible to two girls, Keisha and Lynette. I wanted to be with them in an innocent way, hold their hands on field trips, just be close to them. I didn't want to be near Mike or hold Bubba's hand. So I did not define what was different about me as gay. Others, like the student and teacher I just mentioned, did that for me. Garrett likes this or Garrett doesn't like that, therefore he must want to have sex with other men. Traits and my likes and dislikes that had nothing to do with sex were assigned sexual meaning. And because I didn't know any better and didn't ask anyone, I believed these lies. My identity was sexualized without anyone laying a hand on me. I now see myself through a sexual lens instead of through an innocent child's lens. My home life was good so far as I can remember. Uh, I remember my relationship with my father was great at, at, when I was younger. I don't have a really clear memory of that because I had a drug problem and an alcohol problem, but I do have pictures. In those pictures, he's giving me piggyback rides. I'm laying on his chest watching television. Um, it's obvious to me that at a certain point in my life, I was very close to him. I don't remember exactly when that changed, but there was a good relationship there. My relationship with my mother was not memorable in my early years. I remember much more being attached to my father. My brother and I, I don't ever remember having a relationship with him. I don't remember feeling close to him. I don't remember feeling rejected by him. There was just nothing. Um, so as I went through school and I was continuing to be teased, um, I just, what I learned to do when I heard the word gay, fag, queer, whatever it was that people were calling me is I just shoved it down. I didn't tell anyone, I didn't ask for help, I didn't do anything because I didn't know any better. There was no one to tell me that I was something different than what I was being told I was, partially because I didn't tell anybody. I, I carried a lot of anger towards my father for a long time because I felt like he didn't help me when he should have, um, but he never knew. And I'm quite sure if I told my father that someone told me I looked, I'd be a beautiful woman, that at the very least he would have said something if not done something. Um, so as a kid, I feel I'm pleasing to my father. And then there came a point where I just, it was, something happened. My memory is that we used to, you know, there were a lot of physical activities, wrestling, sports, you know, I mean, badminton, wiffle ball, things like that. Um, and I remember wrestling with him one time and for some reason, I became uncomfortable and I decided to knee him in his groin. And when I did that, my father reacted by saying, I'm done with you. Now, I don't think my father literally meant I'm done with you for the rest of your life, but that's the moment I remember in my mind of something in our relationship changing where I did not feel connected to him anymore. Um, and I think that's when I started to draw closer to my mother. My mother was always very emotional, overly emotional. And just for the record, this is my perception of things. I, I want people to know that I am aware of the fact that what I remember may not be correct and that my perception of things may be distorted. Um, and my parents know, my mother's heard all of this, so it's, it's, she agrees with my perception of many of the things, but she was very needy. So I felt drawn to fulfilling the needs that she was not getting from my father as far as whatever was lacking in their relationship. And I also started to see myself as being more like her than like my dad. 
that um, in conjunction with the fact that I was constantly being told at school that either I was gay or that I was more like a woman, that I was a fag, all of those things together, I just started, it felt so bad to constantly hear this that I just started to accept it. Um, like I said, there were girls that I was attracted to, so it wasn't that there was no attraction there, but what I saw in school was there was a young girl, she would go out on the um, playground with these boys, and she would let these boys hump her. They would get around her in a circle. And it was disturbing to me to see that, and what I saw in that and in a lot of other girls in my school was they seemed to be drawn to men that treated them badly, which I did not want to do. So I, I started to feel confused because I thought there was something wrong with me for not treating women the way these men treated them, which was not the way they should be treated, but they were reacting to the way they were being treated by these men. So it was just very confusing to me. Um, as uh, I got closer to going, when I got into middle school, the bullying intensified. Um, I felt very lonely. I didn't feel any connection to my dad anymore. I didn't, my brother was saying similar things to me that were being said by people in school. He was calling me the same names, telling me I wasn't a man, things like that. Um, so I didn't feel I really had anyone that I could turn to, that any, there was anyone. And I, like I said, I didn't even know that there was anything wrong. So I, I wouldn't have known to ask for help. That's one of the things that bothers me about what I see going on now is that young kids are being told that this is the truth about you. And if they believe it's the truth about them, they're not going to seek anything else. And that's what I did. I just started accepting what I was being told. So as I went through high school, uh, early or middle school, I was exposed to pornography. There was a magazine that was passed around in the neighborhood. This was obviously long before the internet. Um, I looked at it. I was, I was aroused by it. Um, I, I knew there was something wrong with it, but at the same time, I was drawn to it, just like I was with seeing what was going on with this girl on the playground. So uh, somehow my mother found out about it. She and my, the woman that would watch me after school told me they wanted to talk to me about it. And when they talked to me about it, they said, there's nothing wrong with what you looked at. And I just remember inside thinking, well, that's weird because <laughs> you're women. Shouldn't you be telling me there's something wrong with what I've seen? But they didn't. What they said was, what you saw was natural. And obviously, at the time, play, it was Playboy. It was just a naked body. It wasn't, there was nothing sexual going on. But I knew inside that there was something wrong with it. So it just, there were all these things that were confusing to me. And I didn't ever ask anyone. I just tried to come up with my own ideas about, you know, well, this must be OK or this must not be OK. The next um, magazine that was passed around our neighborhood had men and women in it. And there was, I was looking at this particular image of a man and a woman, and I, I'm grateful to God that he's allowed me to remember this clearly because I, I looked at the man instead of the woman. I had never done anything like that. I'd never had any, like I said, when I was in school, I, I wasn't drawn to boys sexually. I didn't want to hold their hands. There was nothing there. But seeing this image, and I believe what it was, was that I had started looking at it and I was objectifying these women. And once I turn these women into objects, then I could easily turn men into objects. And if I'm just using someone for sex, then what difference does it make? Obviously, at like 11 years old, that wasn't the thought process. But looking back at it, I believe that's what happened. I, um, I was very ashamed when I, when I did that. I felt like something, this is not, not right. Um, but I was very, very drawn to it. So I started to seek it out more and more. Um, there were ads in the back of the magazines where you could order things. So I would order catalogs. I would do whatever I could to expose myself to this more and more. But I still was not identifying myself as being gay. That wasn't how I viewed myself. Um, I got into high school. High school was rough, uh, r more rough because the, pe the bullying was more intense. But then in high school, I also had someone who taught me how to use my sense of humor that I got from my father as a weapon against people. So I learned that if somebody said something hurtful to me, I would say something horrible back to them. And it would usually cut it off. Um, so I felt like I at least had some power back at that point. 
which would become a problem for me throughout my life, always looking for some way to feel like I had control and power because I felt so out of control and powerless, not only in school, but with my family. Um, so I went through high school like that. Uh, as soon as I got out of high school, I got a job and I started drinking heavily. I went from never having had a drink to drinking vodka and drinking to the point of blacking out. It was just, I wanted to be drunk. I didn't know why, that was just what I wanted. So I started doing that on a regular basis, and going out and doing very destructive uh, things, vandalizing property, setting fires, destroying people's cars, doing all sorts of terrible things. We, we liked endangering our lives, you know, going on these windy roads at night and turning off the headlights and driving on the wrong side of the road. Um, it seemed exciting. Once again, in hindsight, obviously, there's some sort of self-destructive uh, uh, desire there, but that wasn't what I was thinking about. So um, the drinking intensified. Then uh, I'd seen a movie called Nine to Five. And in that movie, marijuana is glamorized. I mean, they get high, and they giggle, and they laugh, and all their food tastes extra yummy. And it was, I just was like, I, that looks like fun. I would love to do that. So. I didn't want to try crack or cocaine or anything else, but I kept weed was what I wanted. So a friend of mine and I decided to get some. We got it. First time I smoked it, it did nothing. The second time I did it, that was like it. I just loved it. I loved the feeling. I loved everything about it. There was nothing negative about it to me. So now those two things started mixing, drinking and getting high, looking at pornography, and then we started going out to clubs first straight clubs and then gay clubs under the guise of going out because the music in the gay clubs was better. That was how we, what we would tell people to distract from the fact that we were probably there for other reasons. Um, as soon as I got into that environment, what I saw that I was drawn to there was very feminine men. There were two men in particular that I, I still can see clearly in my head because they were very skinny very groomed. Everything was perfect. You know, their eyebrows were perfect. They're, they're, they obviously had makeup on, but they still looked like men. So I was drawn to the mix of, you know, they weren't in drag, but they were still not really masculine men. And I felt, for the first time, um, accepted in that environment, affirmed. Um, I felt like when I was there, I was with people like me. I found people that had decided un subconsciously to stop rejecting who they told they were, who they had been told they were. They decided to accept it. And that was very comforting to me because I'd always felt like an outcast. I'd always felt like I wasn't good enough. I wasn't masculine. So it's like, okay, well, now I found other people that feel that way. Um, so I just dove into that scene. Everything I do, I do. You know, if I get high, I get high. If I get drunk, I get drunk. And if I'm going to go to the club, I'm going to be there every single night and, you know, be there all night. So that became the focus of my life. Um, I got kicked out of my parents' house because I was a bum. And uh, my father told me either get a job or get out. So I chose to get out. I figured out very quickly that I didn't like being a bum as far as, you know, living in a roach-infested home. So I decided to be go to cosmetology school, which I was very hesitant about because it's really gay. That is like the gayest thing you can pick as a man to do, at least in most people's minds, like, you know. Um, but I couldn't think of anything else to do, and I, I knew, my father told me, you figure out what you want to do, you can come back here, but you're not going to live here and just do nothing. So uh, I told them I wanted to go to cosmetology school. I was afraid they would say, are you gay? Um, but they did not, and they accepted it. I moved back home. And I started going to school, and I immediately hated that as much as I hated any other kind of schooling. I just don't like, I didn't like discipline. I didn't like control. I wanted to just do what I wanted when I wanted. So, um, but I started going to school because he basically, he said, if you drop out, I'm done. That's it. I'm not paying. Because I had already gone through college three times. Started college, dropped out, started college, dropped out, started college, dropped out. So he had good reason to say there will be no more uh, support coming from me if you do this again. So I stayed, I finished. While I was in cosmetology school, uh, I met the first person that was one of my, I would say was a boyfriend. Um, I was out at a club, 
a woman approached me and said, my friend thinks you're cute or something. I don't remember exactly what was said. I just went with it. I would basically talk to anyone who would talk to me because I had no self-esteem. So if some man came up to me, fine, I'll go out with you. So we started dating, and that dating basically revolved around drinking. Drinking and sex, that's all it was. So that's why I'm hesitant when I use the word boyfriend, because I think that uh, gives you the impression there was some sort of actual relationship. I don't believe there was any relationship. It was just sex and drinking. Um, he was, I, be, I believed that he was not faithful. He told me I was crazy, so then I, I started to believe that I was mentally ill on top of everything that I was doing, on top of everything else that was going on because I didn't trust myself. I literally saw him kissing somebody else, and when he told me I didn't, I believed him because I doubted myself. I had no, um, I didn't trust myself at all. So I continued to go out with him, dated several other men. Um, as I did that, the marijuana use increased. So it got to the point I ended up dating a drug dealer. The drug dealer sold weed. So I was high all the time, every day. I wasn't high at work. That was how I told, made myself feel better about being a, a drug addict. At least I'm not high at work. But I smoked so much weed every day that there's no way it was out of my system by the time I went to work. Um, in hindsight, that's what I needed to do to be able to live who I was, you know, this lie that I'd been told that I was trying my best to live. I was doing everything I could to be who everyone had been telling me I was throughout my life. Um, and it was not working, obviously, because if you're being who you are, you don't, in general, need to be high and drunk all the time. Um, so I continued to go down that path. Um, I dated three other guys and, and got to the point where I just didn't want to um, live that way anymore. I believed, even, I'd gone to a Christian school, even though I'd been raised Catholic, um, I, I hated the Catholic Church because I'd gone to this evangelical school that told me we worship Mary and we worship statues and we do all kinds of crazy voodoo and all this other stuff. And because I was at that school for eight hours a day, five days a week, and I was at mass one hour a day, one day a week, I just figured they must know what they're talking about. So um, I'd rejected God. I never was able to stop believing in God. I just hated him. And I once again, in the movie The Desire of the Everlasting Hills, uh, one of the people in that movie says that he used to drive by the, the um, cathedral and stick his middle finger up out the window. And I laughed, when, not that it's funny to do that, but I laughed when I heard him say that because I did that once. Um, and someone was in the car with me, and when I did it, he just said, Lord, don't, don't strike him dead while I'm in the car. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with it. So, um, But I hated him because I... What I started doing and what I see, I see with some people who speak publicly is I just started turning Jesus into who I wanted him to be. Well, the Bible was written by corrupt old white men and they all hated gay people and they hated women, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the stuff you hear from people who are trying to make it easier for them to live a sinful life, which is what I was trying to do. So you just try to turn Jesus into someone who just loves you and doesn't really care about anything else. Um, so I, I, I still had that little bit of a connection, and I just kept going through in my mind that this cannot be what God intended for me, for me to sit around. I mean, I had a, a ritual that I went through. I'd get up in the morning, I'd go to work, come home, roll up two big fat blunts, which are cigars that you empty out and fill with weed. I would smoke them, play video games, look at porn, smoke more, play more games, go to bed. And it just was literally that over and over again every day for probably almost 10 years. Um, I spent about $100,000 on weed, and that's just on, and that's a lot of weed. I mean, weed, it, this was not like I was smoking really good stuff, and I, that's why I spent so much. I just, I smoked so much that when people got around me, they could not smoke what I was smoking because they couldn't stop coughing. I didn't cough anymore. Um, I would wake up in the middle of the night soaked in sweat. I would pass out, I woke up one night, and I was laying on the floor in the bathroom with my face next to the toilet, which I thought was charming, a lovely, lovely life I'm living, um, that I'm, I'm this sick from what I'm doing, and I won't stop doing it. So I started to really screw up my career from doing all these things. Lost money, buy less weed, buy less weed, 
my mind started to clear a little bit. And I just, I would talk to my mother, who was not in the church anymore at the time either, and say, this can't be what God intended when he created me, for me to just get through my life every day like this. At this point, like I said, I wasn't dating anyone, but I was exclusively looking at gay porn. Um, and I would have identified myself still at that point as being gay. She said to me one day, because she was out of the church, I, I had very bad, I still have a bad temper, but it was rage that would come out of me sometimes. And I was talking to her on the phone one night and I told her I was going to go to my boss's house and I was going to burn her house to the ground and I was going to set her doors and windows on fire first so I made sure she couldn't get out. And my father called me the next day to tell me how selfish I was. The next time I spoke to her, she, in an <laughs> attempt to calm me down, said, why don't you get a boyfriend? And I said, I don't want a boyfriend. And she said, why don't you want a boyfriend? And I said, because it's not right. How do you know it's not right? I said, because that's what it says in the Bible. She said, I don't remember the exact s s question after that, but she said something like, how do you know it's there? Or how do you know the Bible's true? And what I said to her is, if you want to know what's in the Bible, go buy one. Don't ask me. So my mother bought a Bible and ended up coming back to the Catholic Church because of a drug addict who hated God. Um, <laughs> So uh, she, when she, she went through exploring different faiths. She came, when she came back to the church, we talked more and more, and she just asked me if she could send me things in reference to the teachings of the church so that I would at least hate the church for what it actually taught rather than what I was hearing on YouTube. So I thought that was reasonable. <laughs> and I decided to start doing that. And, I mean, the good thing, my father raised me to be logical. I didn't, I wasn't most of the time, but he raised me to use my mind. And when I started watching and reading what she was sending me, it made sense, especially The Journey Home. That was the show on EWTN that had the greatest impact on me because I saw people who believed what I believed and had been taught, and they were much smarter than me, and they were able to explain why they don't believe that anymore, and they've come back to the church. So um, I continued to watch those things. I stayed open. I just prayed and asked God to help me know the truth, even if it wasn't what I wanted to hear. Um, and I also started praying for him to help me get off weed, because I knew that I could not control myself. So I went through a process of taking a few days off a week. I got to the point where I couldn't function with just getting high. Sometimes it was either do it or stop. So I went to my parents' house. I stayed with them for seven days. I came back and I never got high again. So I went from smoking $230 a week, a week, weed a week, to nothing. And I was very aware that God had done something in my life. I was very emotional. I had a very strong zeal to serve God in some way after that, though I still did not want to be a Catholic. Um, so I started um, changing. God started changing me. He started taking things away from me that I didn't really know that I wanted taken away. I just started losing interest. So I, it wasn't really like I had to do a lot to, um, I mean, I had to make some effort and, and interact and respond to the grace I was being given. But it wasn't like I was saying, I want to stop this and then I want to stop this. It just wasn't the case. It just started, I, I didn't want to play, um, watch movies and TV as much. I didn't want to play games as much. When I tried to do it, it was boring to me. I wanted to read the Bible. I wanted to watch things about the Catholic Church. That was what I felt drawn to. Um, and the more I did that, the, the, the stronger my desire to serve God became. I thought I was, I was sure I was supposed to be a priest, because in my mind, that's what it means. If you're going to serve God, you're a priest. Um, so I started to look into that and was told, you know, you're just off drugs for like five minutes. You really <laughs> should not, at this point, be trying to go into seminary. So slow your roll. So I slowed my roll. I didn't want my roll slowed, but I, like I said, there's just, God was doing something in me because I respected the priests. And that wasn't something I asked for. That wasn't something that I, I wanted changed. It just, I knew if I'm Catholic and the priest is telling me, stop, then I, either I'm not Catholic and I won't listen, or I am and I do. I'm, I'm fairly black and white, which can obviously not be good. But um, So I did what I was told. I, I continued moving forward, studying, working. Um, 
I at some point decided, because I was, I received my first communion, I went to confession, but I never was confirmed. I didn't want to be part of the Catholic Church because I was taught that in the Christian school, Genesis was not necessarily literal, and the, that when I came to that, um, or that it was literal, and when I came to the, the priest with that, he said, don't worry about it. I took that as you can't even explain what you believe, so I don't want to be part of your church. I don't think that's what he meant, but... Um, so I came back, I told my mother I, I felt drawn to being confirmed, so I went through the, the little mini RCIA thing, which I didn't really like, because I wanted to learn more, but I was told that's what I had to do, so that's what I did. Um, I came back into the church about six years ago, and then I started to become more aware of the fact that obviously porn and Catholicism don't really go together, or at least they shouldn't. Um, so I... Um, I talked to a priest and he mentioned courage to me in reference to my same-sex attraction. I didn't really think I needed to be part of courage because I wasn't dating men, so to me I wasn't gay. But um, time went on and I realized something's, I've got to do something. So I, I reached out to the chaplain, I joined this group, and um, I was very uncomfortable with their, you know, they want you to be chaste, they want you to have friends with men, be friends with men, and I was like, there's really nothing here that appeals to me at all. I certainly don't want to be friends with men, and I certainly don't really care about being chaste, but I felt drawn to it, and once again, I just followed that feeling. Um, the first few meetings, I mean, I obviously have no problem running my mouth and sharing very personal things, so it wasn't, that wasn't difficult for me, but the idea that I was supposed to somehow connect to these men, I was very uncomfortable with. Um, but I had made a commitment to go for five meetings, so I went to the five meetings, and uh, I was comfortable there, but just on a, like a superficial level. There was a Courage conference. I went to that conference. During that conference, one of the guys that I did not know came over and put his arm around me while I was sitting there, which I did not like. I do not like people touching me in general without asking me, but especially a man. Um, and I looked at his hand, and he asked, is there a problem? And I said, yes, you're touching me. And he said, is that a problem? And I said, yes, it's a problem. And he said, too bad. And he left his arm there. And all I can tell you is that in that moment, God did something inside of me because when I left there, we went to Mass. And when I came out, I started hugging everybody, which made a lot of people very uncomfortable because I'd been very aggressively against hugging anybody up to that point. Um, the next Courage Conference, I went to a healing service, which I did not want to go to because I see people laying out on the ground, and I don't do that stuff. Um, so I was like, but my friend said I should go, so I went. I went. The priest laid his hands on me, and I almost fell over when he put his hands on me. And he put his arms around me, and I just felt like it was God holding me, and I could not stop crying. Um, it was life-altering. So I got over healing and I got over hugging because of courage. <laughs> um, there's always a high after those things and then you go back to being miserable and, and me, not everybody, but just <laughs> my normal misery and attitude problem would come back. And I, I, I was very frustrated by that because I wanted to be freed from this. That's what my idea of being healed was, was that God was going to take it away. Um, I became aware at a certain point that that was not what God wanted, that God wanted me to be with my people. So I stopped asking for healing and just asked that I would be the man that I was supposed to be. Um, the way God decided to help me grow as a man, I'm a hairstylist, I've always just been a hairstylist, but the, the, built, the salon that I work in decided they wanted me to be a manager. And what I've jokingly told some of my clients is that when there's two things in your life that help you grow in ways that nothing else can. One is having children, and one is death. And when you don't have children, what God sometimes does is says, maybe I should make this person a salon manager. <laughs> because what happens is you end up with 40 children. Not, and I don't mean that in a condescending way towards the people I work with, but you have to learn how to do things that you would not learn how to do if you don't have to care for other people and learn to talk to people differently. So it forced me to grow in ways that I was aware that that was what was happening. So I was able to tolerate the, the irritation and the anger because I knew in the back of my mind that God was working through this to help me be the man that I'm supposed to be. 
So I continue to do that. I continue to want to quit every day. Um, but I just don't let myself, um, I won't allow that. I do have the ability to control my response to my feelings, which is something that I didn't do for most of my life. Um, so that's continued to help me grow. And then about a year ago, I had a female friend come to me and tell me that she was, uh, is attracted to me and that she would like to date me. That was shocking to me because even though I see, you know, the beard and everything that shows me that I am a man, I don't, I, I do now, but I didn't still at that time view myself as being manly or masculine at all. I told my, my therapist that it made me uncomfortable and when he asked me why, I said because I don't understand why she would be attracted to someone like me. And he said, well, why don't you ask her? And I said, oh, that's that's going to be comfortable. Like, <laughs> let's just ask this woman, why are you attracted to me? So what I did was I said it, I did my little manipulation, which was I said, well, he told me to ask you that, but I'm not comfortable. And she said, oh, you can ask me. And I said, oh, good, there. So now I didn't really ask you, but I get to ask you. And she said, well, I can tell you why. First of all, you're physically attractive. And I just, I wanted to hang up on her when she said that. I was so disturbed by that and I went to my spiritual director the next week and I said this has thrown me off that more than just her saying she was attracted to me and when he asked me why I said because in my mind attraction means lust so her saying she's sexually attracted to me means she wants to use me sexually and what my spiritual director said was well I think you're attractive and I don't want to sleep with you <laughs> which I said that's good because if you did that would obviously create all sorts of other problems that I do not need um, so that was, I was aware of the fact that lust and attraction were not the same thing, but that was her just telling me that she was drawn to me in that way. Since then, I put a block on my computer. I care about being accountable to other men. I care about my brothers and our community. I care what impact what I do has on other people, which I think are all fatherly things that came because a woman told me that I could be a father. Those weren't her words, but that's what it did to me, is it helped me see myself the way God sees me, I think. God worked through her in that way. Um, I blocked, I was using chat lines, I blocked my credit cards because one of my brothers encouraged me to do that. And once I did that, since then, my same-sex attraction is greatly diminished. My use of pornography is non-existent. Now, it's only nine months, I'm not saying, but I know that something, when I got off weed, something changed. It didn't mean I was never tempted, but something changed, and that's what I felt after she told me that. Something inside of me changed in a way that won't be changed back, even when I do fall, even when I make bad decisions. You know, it's not like I'm not gonna still have um, attraction but it's, it's something that God has done for me, and I don't believe he's done it for me exclusively. I believe that through therapy, understanding if you're able to, where this comes from, there are reasons. I mean, if you talk to gay people, people who identify themselves as gay, you hear common things in every conversation, but somehow we don't acknowledge that that's what's going on. We say, well, that's just a coincidence. Well, that's ridiculous. If everybody that's on crack smokes crack for the same reason, you wouldn't say, well, that's not why. But for some reason, when we apply it to sexuality, suddenly everybody is afraid to do the same thing. I'm not saying everybody, it's the same reason. But there are reasons. And what I feel most strongly is that I have to share what God has done for me. So other people know that there's a possibility. Even if they choose to live the way they're living, I want them to know that, that, that the choice is there. When people say we don't have a choice, we may not have a choice in our attraction, but we do have a choice in what we do. Um, so in closing, I'd just like to encourage you all to take a copy. There's Desire of the Everlasting Hills. is a film from Courage, three people in it just sharing their stories. There's also a series back there called Invited to Courageous Love, which is for everyone, but it's more geared towards uh, pastors, priests, so they can share it with their um, parishes. Those are both on the table back there. They're free, so I encourage you to take those. Um, and I'd just like to close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for the crosses you allow in our lives that help us to draw closer to you. 
Heal any wounds in us that keep us from receiving your love and give us the grace to endure lovingly those you leave behind. I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Last June was the 40th anniversary of uh, St. John Paul II's visit to Poland uh, in 1979, which began, of course, the Solidarity Movement and uh, eventually the fall of the Soviet Empire. Um, and uh, the Mass for Pentecost, for the Vigil of Pentecost that he, he celebrated on... Um, uh, in Warsaw, uh, the, the people interrupted the mass by chanting, we want God. It was, it was one of the most powerful events. And um, of course, the person who, who to read on this is, is George Weigel, and he just describes it so well uh, about what happened, what that accomplished. But one thing that struck me um, is uh, when he says that what John Paul II accomplished at that moment was it, it basically gave to the Polish people their proper identity. Uh, and, and George Weigel says that, in effect, John Paul II said to them, you are not who they say you are. Let me remind you, or let me tell you who you are. And so he's restoring to them their identity as free persons and as, as children of God. And I, I couldn't help but think of that in, in listening to Garrett this evening uh, because so much of what he had to say and so much about this issue that we're talking about this evening has to do with identity. And we, and, and really that's, that's the fault line, isn't it? And we, we all want to know who we are. And we want others to know who we are as well. To my mind, this is one of the most uh, powerful uh, lines in the Gospels when our Lord says to the apostles, who do you say that I am? He's, he, he's already got the answer about the crowds. Who do the people say the Son of Man is? And <laughs> they're wrong, right? And so he asks the apostles, his, his closest friends, but you, who do you say that I am? And it's sort of a cry of the sacred heart, uh, you know, seeking... Uh, hoping that somebody will sort of know who he is. Um, uh, obviously, it's that, that's a line that's wrought with uh, a lot of uh, theological significance, but um, you know, every so often we need to turn down the divine volume and, and listen to uh, our, our Lord's human nature and, and that desire uh, to be known, the desire that our Lord still has and that each of us still has. Uh, you are not who they say you are. Let me, let me tell you, let me remind you who you are. Um, really, at, at the root uh, of our fallen human nature is a lie about us. Uh, and that's what we encounter in, in Genesis 3, is that, is that the devil comes and he, he tells a lie about, about Adam and Eve and about who they are and about their relationship with God and about what they're intended to be. It's a lie about who they are. And, uh, and so it's not too much to understand uh, the church's mission in these terms, that the church is throughout the world and throughout history restoring us to ourselves and restoring to us our, uh, our proper identity. In effect saying, you are not who the devil has convinced you you are. Uh, let me remind you who you are. You, you are children of God. You're created in his image and likeness. Uh, well, what does this have to do with our, our purposes here this evening? Um, as, I, as I said, I think the argument about identity is very much at the heart of, of the issue of homosexuality in, in our culture. And it gets to the question of you know, where, does, where does my identity come from? Uh, is it something that I create on my own? Or is it something that is received? And, uh, of course, especially we Americans, uh, we like to do things ourselves, right? 
Um, and so w w we want our own. And this is, again, very deep in our wounded human nature. Just, uh, I, I want to do it myself. Uh, I want to claim my own identity. Uh, I am uh, with the Courage Apostolate. Um, that's not my full-time job. I just do it to make ends meet. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and that apostolate, uh, really, so much of what we do is helping people to understand who they are, their proper identity. And, and that is by, by way of the church's teaching, but not, not, not only that, it's, it, it is by way also just of, um, um, well, I mean, there, there's the, the teaching, but then, as I think Garrett has witnessed do very well, uh, the relationships that develop within uh, the Courage groups, uh, where uh, men and, and women can come together and, in a shared struggle, uh, come to a deeper appreciation for one another, and through those relationships, learn more about themselves. Uh, and that, you know, that's true for everybody. Right? In order, really, to, to know ourselves and to, to have a self, uh, we need to be in relationship. And uh, so much of the, the sadness of our culture is that people aren't in relationships as much anymore. And so the, the, the work of courage really kind of centers on that. Um, if I can uh, first just say a, a few words about uh, the church's teaching just in general on, on human sexuality. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have, have come to the other talks on this, in this program, but it is so well, uh, so well laid out. It's, it's really so well done. Because uh, typically when I get invited to, to speak on this topic, I'm like, well, okay, I'm going to do, have to like, you know, begin with, okay, God, right? Um, um, and, uh, but this program is so well, well laid out that, it's, that there, a lot of the work has already been done. But I'd like to just, just um, talk about you know, who we are, uh, what uh, in, in fancy words called theological anthropology, okay? Who we are um, in, in God's mind and according to God's uh, creation. And, and the first thing, and uh, increasingly a very controversial thing, is that we are created male and female. Uh, we are created. <laughs> we don't create ourselves. Uh, we, we are created. This is increasingly a controversial thing to say. Uh, but that's, that's the first thing to, to realize and to accept, uh, is, is that I am created. And I, I, I don't create myself. Uh, and thank God, because <laughs> that's a... That's an awful lot of work, right? Because, I mean, you have to continually, you know, sort of recreate yourself. Um, but we're created male and female. The, these, um, and, and this is a point of great confusion in our culture, uh, but it's deep in, well, it's deep in divine revelation, but you know what? It's deep in biology as well, uh, is that, that, that deep down within each one of us, we are either male or female. Uh, and uh, this, you know, smallest little, you know, uh, part of our body and our DNA, we, we are identified in that way. So that's one thing. Um, and the second is um, we are created in a body and soul unity. Uh, we have the Feast of the uh, Assumption of Our Lady coming up, which is, you know, this is one of those, these dogmas that's, you know, uh, infallibly declared at such a... a um, crucial time, because Mary's assumption, body and soul into heaven, is, is a very strong reminder of God's original intention for us, which is the body-soul union, and I should uh, clarify, harmonious union of body and soul, uh, which is not what we experience, is it? It's not what I experienced at 5.30 this morning, when, <laughs> you know, when my soul said, get up, you're, you're the pastor, you got to go say mass. Um, <laughs> And my body said, no, you know, just <laughs> nine, nine more minutes, right? That's all I need. Um, and in our, in our culture, as we look through our culture, we see there's such an alienation that people experience between body and soul. Uh, in uh, Mary Hassan came and spoke uh, on the issue of, you know, uh, transgender ideology. And, you know, the, the Catholic Church actually has a, has a, a pretty um, solid way of understanding this, is that, we have been teaching for millennia that one of the effects of, of, of sin, one of, the, one of the wounds that we have in our fallen human nature is this disharmony between body and soul. That it, it, at some level, each of us experiences that, and, and some at, at a very deep level. 
uh, but the work of grace uh, within us is, is to help restore body and soul. Uh, but this is God's original intention, that our body is a manifestation of our soul. And the soul is the form of the body, that these are to be harmoniously together, and, uh, and we can't posit a division between them. We can distinguish them, but we can't make a division between them. I mean, if you divide body and soul, what do you have? You have a corpse, right? Um, and so intellectually, if we divide body and soul, then, 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 then we, we've lost something. Uh, extraordinarily uh, important, indeed essential. So we're created man and female, male and female, uh, the, the union of the body and soul, and then, of course, complementarity. The complementarity of man and woman. We are created male and female, um, not just to frustrate us, right? <laughs> Although sometimes it seems that way, I know that. Um, you know, there's the ancient myth of the Greeks that we are initially created um, asexual, and then as a punishment we are <laughs> you know, divided in two, and, uh, and so uh, divided into male and female, and so you spend your life searching for your, your other half. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's the whole you complete me sort of thing, right? And it can, sound, it, it can sound romantic in a sense, but deep down, it's incredibly pessimistic because it sees the relationship between man and woman as uh, essentially antagonistic and, and Whereas divine revelation um, reveals the distinction between man and woman as ordered towards their union. Uh, and that's what we mean by, that, by complementarity, is that they are distinct and different so that they can become one. Uh, two ways uh, a friend of mine likes to illustrate it. I'm just being honest that I'm stealing this, okay? Um, and. Uh, well, one is to consider the human body uh, and, and the various members and organs of the human body, which in order to understand them and each one of them and how they work together, it's sufficient just to have one body and observe it or dissect it or you know, whatever. Um, so you can understand the various members and organs that way. The significant exception to the rule is human genitalia because uh, that part of the human body cannot be understood or explained uh, on its own. It can only be understood and explained in relation to another body of the opposite sex, just medically speaking. Um, another way of understanding this, or sort of illustrating that this is something we already know, is, is to ask the question of all of you, um, please raise your hand if you have a reproductive system. Okay. I see, this is a better crowd than most, but um, I love doing this with college students because the, the girls all raise their hands, okay? Because reproductive health is women, right? And the, and, and the boys are like, um, pretty sure I have a role, but I'm not clear on, all right. And of course, the, the, the answer is that no, no one person does, right? The reproductive system is not something that one person has, himself or herself. The reproductive system requires two persons of the opposite sex. So these are things that we already know, uh, but that uh, divine revelation reminds us of. Uh, this is a great example of what Pope uh, Benedict XVI called uh, faith purifying reason. Okay, so we can know these things by reason, but we seem to have forgotten them. And so this is where faith um, helps to purify our reason so that we can see these things more clearly. Um, that helps us to understand a little bit of who we are, uh, those truths, and uh, what our bodies are for, what our sexuality is for, um, and then specifically to the work of courage. Uh, courage was founded 30 years ago, uh, just about, and um, in New York, and it, it was uh, a, a response just to, to the simple um, observation that, the, that if the church has a teaching, 
people should be assisted in living out the teaching, right? And we do that for a whole lot of people. We help, we help families live out the teaching on family. We help cu married couples live out the, the teaching on, on, on married love and so on. Um, we even have things for priests to live out, for a priest to live that out, believe it or not. So, um, and, uh, and so this is what happened to me uh, in 2001 at a priest council meeting. I observed that uh, we had, um, uh, we have a very clear teaching, but we had nothing in the Diocese of Arlington to help people live the teaching. Made my point, right? And that was awesome. And then, of course, if you know anything about how committees work, um, <laughs> at the next meeting, I was named the, <laughs> you know, chairman of an ad hoc committee, too. So, but, uh, and that was, that was a great blessing because that uh, brought me into involvement with Courage and I've served as a chaplain to um, greater or lesser degree uh, in a, the Arlington chapter uh, for the past 15 years. And uh, I've also served as, uh, on the board of directors of the international organization. It's not that impressive. I mean, it's an international organization. It is actually international, but I think we have four full-time employees, something like that. Um, but uh, so what is, the, what is our work? And, and, and how do we see the church's response to this struggle? Um, I'd, I'd like to, to, well, just to kind of summarize it as revealing true identity, is helping men and women come to know themselves as children of God. In effect, it's saying, it's helping them to understand that. Uh, in the Catechism, we find a threefold distinction uh, in, in, this, uh, in this area of teaching. And this, is, this threefold distinction is, is what is really sort of the, the template for courage's work. Uh, and the, the first is, um, well, very unpopular, and that is that homosexual activity uh, is um, always and at all times wrong. So the, those actions, the actions, the actions uh, are always at an all time sinful. And so no situation can, can change their um, uh, immoral nature, no, no good intentions. These are um, what uh, theolo theologians call intrinsically immoral acts, okay? Now, if you've heard me say that people or persons are always at an all time sinful, uh, please get that out of your mind. That was not said. We're talking about the actions, right? Um, these aren't the only intrinsically immoral actions, right? But, um, but it seems to be the ones that, that uh, the, the culture focuses on uh, when, when addressing the church's teaching on this issue. So that's first the actions. And then, you know, kind of going closer to the person, uh, we, we talk about the attractions. And, and the church's teaching is simply that um, the attractions are objectively, and that's a very important word because it's, it's, it means that this is not a statement about any individual person's culpability or guilt, but the attractions are objectively uh, disordered, which is, I, I recognize, that's, that's a word that falls very heavily on, uh, on modern ears. And what does it mean? It simply means th that the sexual attraction is ordered towards uh, you know, male towards female, female towards male. That is part of the truth of being created, male and female, and being created for a complementary relationship. Uh, and so that disorder is not a statement on the person's goodness, uh, not a statement about a person's guilt or culpability or anything like that. Um, in my years with working with courage, uh, I know very well that uh, men and women can experience these attractions uh, and be a whole lot holier than I am. Uh, and so when we say objectively disordered, that, for, that, that objectively is a, is a very important thing to keep in mind there. And then you know, the most important uh, dimension is, is not the actions, which are the most external. It's not the attractions, which are more interior, but still they're not the core. The core is the person himself or the person herself. Uh, and, and what's the church's teaching for persons who uh, engage in such actions or have such attractions? Well, same as with any other person. The person is good. Not everything the person does is good. Not everything that the person experiences is correct. But the person is always to be not just respected and treated with dignity, um, 
but to be loved. And the person is the one that Christ died for. The person has been redeemed and is or is meant to be a child of God, which is an extraordinary thing to say about any person, right? Um, now, most of the work is, and, and I think we, we have a sense of this from Garrett's testimony, right? is between those, those the, the, the second and the third level, between the attractions and the person, because um, it, it, it's very possible, and I, a lot of people experience this, is, is to understand oneself according to one's attractions. Under, uh, in other words, taking one's identity from what one experiences. Uh, and that, that's something I think, you know, Garrett, Garrett certainly, uh, 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 he witnessed to that, right, the, to that struggle. And so, so much of the work of courage is, is basically saying, no, no, that is not who you are. You are not the sum total of your sexual attractions. Uh, that's something you experience, and it might be something that you experience so deeply that you do think it is essential to your being. But this, this is where, you know, the mission of the church is, is to help us restore us to ourselves and, and say, well, the, the truth about who you are is something much deeper than just uh, the sexual attractions. And, um, and that can be a life's work. Uh, Garrett, <laughs> uh, I've known Garrett for a while now, and uh, he's put a lot of work into this. <laughs> As he said, he, he doesn't do things halfway, I think. If he's going to grow a beard, he's going to grow a beard, right? <laughs> um, and uh, that, is, that is our, our work. And um, we, the, the heart of it is the, the meetings of our chapters uh, in different dioceses and cities. And so there's a, a chapter, actually there are two chapters in the Diocese of Arlington. There's one in Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, um, Philly, and uh, New York, and uh, throughout the country, uh, and throughout the world. And they become a source of support for men and women who experience um, these attractions and, and want to live chastity, want to live the, the, the church's teaching. But, you know, it's very similar to um, what many uh, members of AA experience, which is that they go there for one reason, like, okay, I've got a drinking problem, <laughs> and, and I don't want to have that. And then in addressing that, they realize that, wait a minute, that there's so much more that I can become. And there's so much, I can go so much deeper than just addressing the alcohol. And, I, and we've heard that from Garrett, right? I mean, what drew him to courage was the, the struggle with same-sex attractions. But uh, as he himself bore witness, th this actually has gone much deeper, hasn't it? To, you know, healing of relationship with his father and, and, and sort of understanding himself as a man and with fatherly responsibilities. Uh, and so that, that's, that's our hope. It's, it's not just, you know, we want people to kind of white knuckle it and just, you know, um, not act out. That, that's a low bar. No, we want people to live chastity that is, um, that is life-giving. And, and that's something that, uh, that our culture doesn't understand, and I'm, I'm not sure any culture has understood. Um, chastity is a virtue, it is a virtus, it is a power. Uh, we typically um, think of chastity uh, according to what it is not. <laughs> chastity means you don't do the following things, right? And high schoolers just want to know the following things so they can get as close to them as possible, right? Um, and, um, but chastity is not defined that way. Chastity is defined by a positive. It is the, the integration and, and the, the, the mastery of our sexual desires and inclinations and attractions in such a way that, that we are in control. Uh, and that this, of course, has to be a work of grace. Um, that's our essential work. And, um, and, I, and, and our, the two documents that we go by in, in this, and um, one is the uh, 1986 document. I should say, Courage was founded 40 years ago, not, not, not 30. So the 1986 document by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, um, signed by Cardinal Ratzinger, um, is, is still today one of the best documents written on this issue. And in terms of its, its theological clarity and its pastoral charity. And people, unfortunately, think those things are um, opposed to one another. But it's not charitable uh, to be unclear, right? 
uh, it is a great charity to bring people the truth. Uh, and then at the same time, bringing people the truth must always be done in a charitable manner. Uh, so that's one document, the 1986 document. It's um, <laughs> uh, on pastoral care of homosexual persons. Okay, and then the other document is a 2006 document from uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, which is something to the effect of pastoral care of um, those with same-sex attractions. Okay, you'll notice the distinction in those titles because the 1986 document and other documents from the church um, previously used the term homosexual persons. And it's a term that the church has backed away from quite deliberately. Why? Well, because there are only three kinds of persons, right? I've got to say this in front of Dominicans, right? Okay. <laughs> there, 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 there are human, there are angelic, and there are divine persons, okay? Okay, there are a lot of human persons, tons of angelics, and um, only three divine. Okay, um, but uh, we don't want to uh, predicate human, uh, we don't want to pre predicate persons in any other way, right? Um, and and the, the entire work of courage, for example, is to say, no, you are not defined by this. This is an aspect of, of what you experience, and it might be a very uh, intense and deep-seated one, but that doesn't define you as a person. We want to know who you are as a person, we, and we want to, to, to bring that out. So those two documents, 1986 from the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith and 2006 from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, those guide our work. And um, I, I'd like to, well, I want to open it to question. I want to give um, plenty of time for that. Um, but I, I want to say a word about uh, healing uh, because Garrett touched on that and, um, and it's kind of a controversial thing, not what Garrett said, but... Um, because there is a school of thought called, um, or an approach called reparative therapy, okay? And, um, and it's actually people are seeking to outlaw it. And uh, reparative therapy, uh, if I can paint in broad strokes here, and this is a generalization, of course, but it, it begins with the premise that, okay, you are um, this kind of person, and you come to therapy, and you will become that kind of person. Um, sort of repairing things and, you know, um, the, that's not the work of courage. The work of courage, and, and why is it not the work of courage? Because we reject the premise that somebody is a homosexual person or somebody is gay. Um, no, we, we want to address them as persons. So much of this issue uh, uh, involves the temptation to, to generalize, because when we generalize, then we don't have to deal with particular persons. Um, and it, it, it's much easier that way. But um, we, don't, we don't begin with the presumption that somebody is that particular kind of person. Uh, we see them as persons. Uh, persons who are experiencing uh, great struggles, perhaps, um, but, but persons. And we want, we want to emphasize um, what it means to be that person. Um, but still there's a healing, and Garrett, um, Garrett witnessed to that, just the healing that he's experienced in his years with courage and sort of working on things on his own. Um, you know, this is something that should happen to any of us when we start addressing our vices. Uh, I mean, wh whatever our vice might be, if we start taking it seriously and addressing it, and availing ourselves of the, of, the, of the helps, both natural and supernatural, to, to, uh, to be healed of this vice, to be delivered from it, then we'll, we'll find healing in other areas of our lives as well. Um, and so that, that happens in courage. You know, guys come in and they, they're addressing things. I mean, we call it courage for a reason. Uh, it takes guts to stand up and do what Garrett did. And uh, it, it, it takes a lot of courage to f turn and face what you've either tried to indulge or run away from for, for years. Uh, that's true for many different vices. Um, our group just kind of, we, we corner the market on the name, right? So, um, but uh, when, when you turn and address, address that, then, then that's, that's when the healing comes about and occurs, uh, not just in this area, but, but in, you know, as it applies to, to any vice. Um, and then, uh, before we open it to questions, uh, the power of words. Um, 
uh, Garrett witnessed to how just the words thrown at him, how damaging those were. One, one of the silliest lines is, you know, the old sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, actually, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, being beaten up is probably better, <laughs> better than, than, than having, you know, lies basically whispered into your ear about who you are or y lies uh, yelled at you about who you are. Um, and so uh, we always have to be careful and precise with our language. And um, one of the things that I, I've started saying when I give talks like this is to, to ask forgiveness in advance if any, if, if any, any of my words have, have wounded because I, I don't mean them to. Um, but I always uh, hope to speak the, the, uh, the truth with, with clarity and charity. And, um, and so uh, we can probably get, get into that as well uh, during the Q&A is you know, the proper, proper vocabulary and language to use uh, in this issue. Who are we? Right? We all want to know who we are. We all want to know our identity, and we want others to know that as well so that we can be loved for who we are. Uh, and so our Lord has come into the world to restore us uh, to the Father, as children of God, and thereby to restore us to ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Garrett, for telling, for sharing your story. Thank you very much, Father Scalia, for your, your um, helpful words. So why don't we have Q&A, and I'll, I'll bring you the microphone. So just wait till I, uh, I come to you. And can I thank Father for acknowledging the Feast of St. John Vianney, okay, the patron of parish priests. The Dominicans have a lot of saints on the calendar. We only have one, okay? So, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, um, the question is this, is um, when does the lecture start and will the Archdiocese of Washington be uh, supporting you all? And go possibly to parishes around here, our home territory or and, and beyond. <laughs> I'm not touring. <laughs> I, I have two full jobs, two full time jobs already. Um, that's up to Garrett and the Archdiocese. <laughs> yes, that's up to the Archdiocese. Okay. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, there's the Courage Conference every year. We just had a couple weeks ago uh, in Mundelein, Illinois. And, um, and there are, you know, different presentations. So uh, visit the Courage website to find, you know, kind of more opportunities and things like that. Thank, good evening, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm a lay Dominican, and so I'm originally from Africa, speaking French. So I need this, I think, for 25 years. Um, I become Catholic very young, and I just turned uh, 71 years old. Um, I have a serious problem. I think everybody may understand me. I bought my uh, first Bible, what we call uh, Jerusalem Bible, when Vatican II and the church allow theologians to print a Bible and give it to Catholics. I bought mine in 1965. Uh, at that time in my country, I was maybe the only lay person having the entire Bible. My problem is, I, don't, I think you know Romans chapter 1, verse 24 to 27. Paul is referring to homosexual life in the Gentile pagan among the Romans. The Catholic Church had to welcome everyone as to become what? A state religion organization by 300 Eri. It was then ruled by the noblemen, as although many of them remain pagan. You can agree with me that most of the upper clergy members were not really transformed into the sanctity demanded by Christ. This upper clergy comprises 
the priest, the bishop, archbishop, cardinal, and pope. Until today, it has not changed. The book um, entitled Sodoma in French, or in the closet of the Vatican, written by Frederick Martel, revealed that the homosexual life is still exists in the church since the fourth century when the noblemen national the church and start ruling it. Can we believe that such a sinful life is still found in the church with the writing like the theology of Christian perfection written by Antonio Royo, O.P., and Jordan Orman, O.P. in 1962. Spiritual theology by Jordan Orman, O.P. 1980. The glory of God grace, a deification according to St. Thomas Aquinas by Dr. Darius Spinoza in, 19, in 2015. Uh, St. Catherine of Siena, dialogue, and many other saints and theologian writing. My problem is when can the church stand up and clean it up so that we really reflect what the theologians and the saints want us to be? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think. Um Unless you want to take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, by the way, the, the, the prayer for, for this series is, is just, a, it's, it's a wonderful prayer. Um, and, and the last petition is purify your church. Uh, the Second Vatican Council describes the church as semper purificanda, meaning always needing to be purified. There is, has been no point in the church's history, save from when Our Lady was the sole member of the church at the Annunciation. <laughs> there has no, been no point in the church's history in which she was not in need of purification in her members. Okay. Um, so yes, we have become very aware of grave immorality within the church. Um, and uh, if you're familiar with church history, um, <laughs> church history is somewhat of a balm because you go, well, gosh, okay. Uh, this is not the first time we've had to face this. And it probably won't be the last. The church is always needing to be purified. Uh, we don't uh, get discouraged because of these things, uh, but neither do we shrug them off. Uh, we, we should, with every, we have every right to expect among the clergy um, uh, purity. And, and, and that should be insisted on. As for the book that you, that, that you cited, I, I would just refer people to Jeff Myers's review of it. Uh, and, um, at um, uh, Catholic Culture website, so. Good evening, uh, Father Scalia, and thank you very much for inviting them here. Uh, my name is Jay Castaño. I have been a member of St. Dominic's for about 35, 36 years. I'm just across the street. Um, you said that courage does not look at a person and then say, well, that person is a homosexual or gay or lesbian. In that sense, I feel uh, totally negated or excluded from the word person. I have been gay since I have uh, knowledge of myself in a sexual way because of the attractions. Uh, perhaps because I wanted to please my family, I was married. I was married to a woman for three and a half years, and uh, we did not have any children. I'm glad that did not happen because I realized that I was not going to please her, and uh, our marriage was abolished. Or, you know, the church annulled it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was annulled. So. I feel that for many, many years, I have been, um, you know, very close to the church. I have never left the sacraments. I discussed this with Father Haddad, who was one of the, uh, he was for a while the uh, pastor, and also with Father Solomon. 
but I do feel that people, just like I am a Latino, or that I was a refugee at one time, I feel that you know people need to have a sexual identity. And if we have an identity that we are comfortable with, then that should be acknowledged. I have friends who are priests. One of them went for three years to Dr. Robert Nicolosi. You mentioned reparative therapy. And at the end of the three years, he came back and he was very displeased with the therapy. And he told me it was a total waste of time and money. So I'm not sure if courage tries to change people to become heterosexual. But if, if somebody is gay and wants to have a relationship with another person of the same sex and even get married, like in many countries, gay marriage is now legal. In particular, you know, my father's country is Spain. For many years, the people there who were homosexual were persecuted. Spain is the birthplace and cradle of Opus Dei. And Opus Dei was hand in hand with Francisco Franco, a dictator. So now there are about 11 countries including Spain and Argentina, our, our Pope's home country and so forth, that have legalized gay marriage. So I want to be recognized as a person, but as a person who is gay. That is my identity. Well, thank you, sir. I, um, I didn't mean to offend at all. And, uh, but I, it, obviously, there, there's, there's a, a d deep disagreement here about, about you know, what characterizes the identity, the identity of the person. Um, and so I, I'm sorry if I offended, that's, that's not my intention, but at the same time, I can't, uh, I can't um, retract what I said, and I won't, because I, I think it's very important that we, that we always um, understand the person as, as, as the person and not, and not begin the modifications, especially those that, that are clearly contrary to, uh, to what our Lord has revealed. And also, courage does not encourage anybody to change anything. Courage is there for people like me who inside have a sense that this is not who we are. This is not our identity. And courage is there for us to help us. Courage does not go out and draft people or force people to do anything. I came to them because inside of myself, I knew differently than what I'd been told my whole life. That is for me. That's what I knew. And there was nowhere else for me to go. But I, they have never, I should have been more clear. There was no um, encouragement to change. It was there to support, is there to support people living chaste lives. That's all. They didn't tell me um, to go to therapy. They didn't encourage me to pursue anything. I went to therapy, and as I went to therapy, I learned more about myself, and I started to see a pattern in my life where I connected certain things that I felt I wasn't, and I was looking for them in other people. So for me, that came from therapy, but that was nothing, I should have made that more clear when I spoke. That was not something courage encouraged me to do. Um, it's something I pursued on my own, and what courage is there to do is help people who feel the way I feel, and a lot of other people feel, um, to have a place to go. Thank you. What are some things that we can do as a parish and in our families to help, to help our loved ones and people in our communities? I see some churches have sort of gay pride masses or they march in parades, but I, just some tangible things that maybe we can, we can take away from this. Um, I mean, what, for me and my family, what I had, my parents were not religious at the time, so I don't know how it would work, but my, I knew my parents loved me and that their love had nothing to do when I was on drugs. My father said to me once, I accepted you as you were, even though they didn't necessarily agree with or like what I was doing. I never felt that I couldn't go home. I never felt that I was, I was being rejected. And I, it's, it's a fine line, obviously, between someone feeling encouraged and someone feeling, um, I don't know what the word would be, I, I felt accepted, and that's what people need to feel. 
they're not going to change because you tell them you need to change or you're bad or you're this or that. It has to come from, I mean, prayer. My mother prayed for me. I believe that's, you know, people will come to me and say, what do I say to my child? I don't know what you can say to your child or to your brother or your friend that they haven't already heard. But what you can do is pray and let them know that you love them. If they ask you to do something that you don't agree with, you just have to be honest and say, I can't participate in that, but I love you. And if they choose to say, well, if you can't do this, then you, know, you can't be part of my life. I mean, that's, that's something that courage and encourage, especially encourage with parents and family members, helps them to find a way to stay connected. But for me, it was knowing that I was loved um, and supported no matter what I did, but also encouraged to not stay where I was. Yeah, picking up on that, uh, you know, what we find in our Lord is an extraordinary combination of uh, an openness to every single person and a challenge <laughs> to every single person. Our Lord's first words are not, um, um, they're kind of a curious invitation, um, repent, <laughs> right? repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, and that's, of course, meant for everyone. But, I mean, when we read through the Gospels, we see that everybody came to him because the, everybody felt that they could, right? They, they felt welcomed by him, and he wasn't going to turn anyone away. But at the same time, what we find in him is, is a tremendous, um, well, I, I don't think it's too much to say a severity because he, he's calling them to something more. So the, the, the greatest example, to my mind, is the woman caught in adultery, right? Uh, and, and he shows this incredible mercy to, towards her. And a severity towards her, her would-be um, uh, you know, persecutors. But then he says to her, you know, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't, don't sin anymore. So he, he, he's not just saying, well, listen, it, it, it's okay. They're leaving you alone now. Um, that would actually not, not show respect for her. He calls her to what he had called her to from eternity. And, um, and so I think every parish has to strive to, to, to cultivate that attitude and that disposition, that, that everybody's absolutely welcomed and everybody's gonna be challenged. Uh, a friend of mine received an email from someone who was, um, uh, basically said, uh, you know, I um, was a trans, transgendered in, in individual and said, will I be welcome at your parish? And, um, and so he, he emailed uh, you know, some, some friends and just well, you know, asked for advice. How do I respond to this? And it led to a very good you know, discussion. And basically, everybody, of course everybody's welcome, but everybody should also feel a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> I, so I, I'm, I'm a pastor, uh, j just recently named a pastor, and I, I'm very aware, if, if I'm not making people feel comfortable, then I'm doing something wrong. If I'm not making people feel uncomfortable, I'm doing something wrong, right? <laughs> so there should be both that, that, that welcome, you know, uh, uh, what's, um, who is it? Is it James Joyce who says, who describes the Catholic Church as, here comes everybody, right? <laughs> you know, and so you do this massive humanity in all shapes and sizes and, you know, everything. Um, everybody should, should, should be welcome, but at the same time, everybody should be made, uh, should be made uncomfortable should, because they should be challenged to, uh, to, to the gospel ideal. And the gospel ideal is possible because of grace, right? It's possible. Um, and um, what was the other thing I was going to say, Gary? <laughs> OK. Uh, well, that's good enough. <laughs> so I, I think you just answered that. But oh, wait. No, I thought of it. <laughs> Sorry. OK. OK. It was like a five-second rule. I thought of it. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I'm not, I don't, I, don't get, um, I don't get a commission every time I mention how great this program is. <laughs> but, you know, the strength of this whole series is that it's addressing the entire issue. I've been asked to speak to a lot of groups, and, and a lot of times it's youth groups. Will you come and speak to our youth group on, on homosexuality? I say, no. <laughs> Why not? Well, I'll come and speak on human sexuality. And within that context, we can address homosexuality. But it's not as though... Uh, the issue of homosexuality is the only issue. <laughs> it's not like everybody is li living lily white purity, right? And it's just this one group that's ruining it for the rest of us. No. Um, no, I, I, I mean, there's, you know, um, the, 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 the use of contraception, um, the, the, the hooking up culture, which is going to be addressed, you know, all, all, all of these different things, um, the pornography, um, 
the, the, the scandals in the clergy, all of these different things need to be addressed. So I think another uh, aspect of the parish is that it, ha it has to address it when it addresses, addresses it uh, in its entirety, not piecemeal, uh, which is one of the strengths of this, this uh, series. So Father, I just wanted to ask um, about the practicality of things and the sense of, the sense of truth. Now Joyce did say, you know, here comes everybody, except now the church is diminishing more and more and more. And, and uh, women priests and abortion and all these things are worldwide, but except for the Catholic Church. And I know Pope Benedict once said that, you know, we're just going to have a smaller church. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, what, the, what does that have to do, what, what does that make a, a truth into? That we, we just, we're, we're just not going to be uh, um, uh, what's that, enveloped by everybody in the, in, in the Christian faith, let alone the, the worldwide uh, sense of beliefs. No, I'm not sure I understand. Well, the I don't question. know. Uh, what am I asking? <laughs> I just I, does it seem like we're just going to get smaller and smaller? That we're just not even going to be a, a, a body of strength? We might. Keep in mind, we're we're just the United States. I mean, you look at other areas of, of the world, and the church is growing rapidly. Okay, and and so and and that's the way it's been throughout history. You know, the church was vibrant in Europe. Sent missionaries to Ireland. The church in Europe sort of foundered, and the missionaries from Ireland came back and said, okay, you know, we're, we're helping again. The Irish sent missionaries to African nations, and now African nations are sending missionaries to Ireland, you know? So, so uh, yeah, it, it, could be, it could be that the church gets smaller. You read the book of Revelation and, and read the catechism on, this, on, this, uh, uh, on, on the end of the world and, and our Lord's return. And, you know, the sense is not that things get better and better and better and better and better, and then Christ comes again. No, it's that actually things get more severe for Christians as, as, as history unfolds. And, and so it should be surprising to us uh, if, if things uh, get, get smaller, uh, especially uh, in, our, um, um, in, in, in our area here. I mean, today's gospel is all about the suffocating um, power of, of wealth. Well, we're living in one of the wealthiest areas of, of the world and of history. Sure. So we shouldn't be surprised if um, there's some suffocation of, but, but one thing's for sure, and we see this in other denominations, if you trim your sails to, to um, you know, and, and trim the truth in order to draw people in, it never works. So wh why should I go to your church if you're just like everybody else? Right? So if you try to make yourself like everybody else, well, then why should anybody come? <laughs> I can go anywhere now, right? So, and just because of timing, we'll just have two, two last questions. So. Garrett, my question is for you, and I see you have the crucifix around your neck, and it looks maybe like a miraculous medal. And I don't know, you probably wear that at work? Yes. Okay. So my question is, does that lead to some interesting conversations at work? And could you maybe share one? Well, I mean, I had a man come up to the front desk and ask me if I was in drag. He said, are you a recovering Catholic? And I said, no, I'm not recovering. And he said, oh, are you in drag? And I just ignored him. Um, I have people that walk through the salon, and they won't make eye contact with me. I have people that, I mean, my clients have to talk to me, so <laughs> they don't. They ask questions. I mean, some of my clients, I've been cutting hair for 20 years, so some of my clients knew me when I was very uh, involved in the lifestyle, and um, they don't understand. They, don't, they can't deny that I'm, I mean, I'm happier. I don't use drugs. I don't use alcohol. I have a relationship with my father. I have a relationship with my brother. I'm not angry all the time. There's nothing negative except Jesus. If you could just have all of that and just leave God out of it, and I won't, and I will not. And when they ask me certain things, I mean, I had a woman say to me one day, are you, um, I told her I was speaking. She said, what are you speaking about? And I said, um, the church is teaching on homosexuality. So the next time she came in, and then she asked me a question, and I just went through like a 20-minute rambling. Um, and when I got done, she said, I, I have nothing left to ask because you've answered every question. The next time she came in, she said, I said, I'm speaking. She said, oh, you mean because you're gay and Catholic? 
And I knew she was trying to get a rise out of me, and I just say nothing. So if people ask me something and I can engage with them, I do. I'm very open with everything, which may not always be good, but I'm not really, as I said, uh, there's not a lot of middle. Um, I'm in a neighborhood where my mother said, who talks about Jesus or the Catholic Church in a positive way because I work in DuPont Circle? And I said, probably no one. So, I mean, I get all kinds of, of comments and things like that, but I know that I'm there for a reason. And thankfully, because of um, the fact that God has taken everything else out of my life, I study and read and pray. So I'm, in a general way, able to respond to most of those people in a way that I think they're not offended. They just aren't necessarily comfortable. My outfit gets questions, too. Okay. okay. Just if you're curious. Okay. <laughs> well, sort of following up on that question, how can we as parents and friends um, and just people out there in the world, um, how do we, and is, is a group like Encourage something that would be helpful to sort of teach us how to um, talk to people and engage them with love and charity, but also um, tell them what's true and not, and not fall into the temptation to sort of tell people what they want to hear because it makes them feel better in the moment. Good. So um, she mentioned Encourage, and, and Garrett had referred to it as well. Encourage is uh, the branch of the Courage Apostolate that is uh, uh, it, it's the, the parents and family members of, of men and women who are uh, you know, mainly uh, in, in the gay lifestyle and, and how, how, do, you know, how do they respond to this and, and what's the best way to respond that, that unites both, both truth and charity uh, because the temptation is you know, to, to have <laughs> truth without charity which is to say, okay, this is the truth, you're not living it, I'm done with you. Okay, not a good response, all right? And then, the, of course, the, the opposite temptation is to, say, is to say, well, love love is love, right? And love permits all things, and therefore, everything's okay. Which is, is that's not honest either, okay? And, and so there's, there's this very difficult situation of, you know, how do I love this person wh whom I believe is actually um, doing harm to himself? Uh, it's not just violating a rule. Um, or going against a, a doctrine, it is you know, doing harm to himself, setting himself at odds with himself. Um, how do I continue to love the person um, in that? And then in, when the person you know, is, is defiant or whatever else. Okay, so that, that, that's what encourages about. And you know, um, I've received uh, phone calls over the years from you know, uh, a parent will call and say, Father, my son or, um, is in DC, he's in the gay lifestyle. I want you to talk to him. <laughs> and, and, and I had a, one such conversation, with the, 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 and the guy came, came and met with me. He was a really nice guy. We, we got along fine, but we both had the understanding that the only reason we're meeting is because his mom wanted us to, okay? <laughs> that that um, he really didn't have any interest in speaking to me, and I, I didn't really have any interest in, in speaking to him if he didn't want to hear from me. Right? As, as Garrett said, you know, I'm not, I wasn't going to drive him kicking, screaming into my office and, and harangue him about things. Um, and so what the parents, especially in Encourage, um, come to understand is that you know, the, the first insti instinct, and, and this is not exclusive to this area, right? I mean, we all do this, right? The first instinct is fix it, right? Um, and, uh, and God is saying, well, actually, you know, maybe you... Need, need to be changed. Maybe you know your 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 way of loving the other person or your way of, of loving the truth need, needs need, needs to be changed in this situation. Maybe your challenge um, uh, in your own prayer life and your your own love for others. And so, um, and courage isn't about okay. How can we get our children to be back on the right track? It's not what it's about. It's about how can we um, help the parents uh, to become more prayerful. Uh, more, more in union with the Lord uh, so that they can love their children better um, and love them in the truth. So that, that's Encourage's mission. Um, uh, it's, it's really sort of um, distinctly for 
uh, parents and other family members. So, um, but I would encourage you to visit the Courage website to find other resources um, and uh, you know different writings and things like that. But uh, but again, you know what I said about our, our Lord's disposition of always being welcoming and always being challenging. Um, I've told um, a story before of a woman I knew who was a daily communicant, um, and uh, she was active in her community and. Um, Every year, she would uh, team up with this uh, other man uh, in the area on, a, on, on some project in the local high school. And he was an active homosexual. And she's a daily communicant, very, very devout Catholic. And, um, but they worked on this thing you know, for years together, every year. And, um, but they, just, they never talked about that issue. And they got along great. But they just, they just knew, OK, this is, this is something that we really disagree on. And, and if we press it, we'll, we'll lose the good parts that we do have, right? And as the years went by, um, uh, he, I don't know what prompted it, but he had a conversion of heart, and he uh, told his partner that, and his partner basically just, that, that was the end of it for him. Um, and uh, so this man found, found himself very much alone, and uh, it was wondering who he could reach out to for just, just somebody to talk to. And he, he reached out to this woman uh, who was, you know, quite opposite of him. And, um, and she was a, a, a source of support and of encouragement for him. And I, that's always struck me as a great example of, of just, you know, being there for people and, and, and letting the Lord and his grace do, do, do the rest. So thank you once again. Thank you. And perhaps if any of you had any further questions or concerns, perhaps uh, you could always come up afterwards. So just a couple of announcements. Uh, we have the Solemnity of St. Dominic on Thursday. And so we're going to have a very beautiful Mass in the evening, 7 o'clock. Of course, is the, the founder of our order and the patron saint of our church. And we'll have a veneration of the relic of St. Dominic and St. Thomas Aquinas afterwards. And then we'll have a reception down here. So you're all most welcome to that. And then next Sunday, we're going to have Jason King uh, come in. He's done a lot of studies on the hookup culture. A lot of people have no clue what's going on in college campuses these days. So that will be very interesting. And of course, uh, trying to sort of expose it. Um, and also, how can we have a better alternative? So, so we hope that you come back next week. Um, let's end with a prayer. Actually, Father Paul, could you uh, maybe end us with a prayer and, and your blessing? Yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God and Father, we ask the gift of your Spirit uh, upon our culture and upon all those uh, wounded by the sexual confusion in our culture, uh, all those who've wounded others and, and themselves in this. We ask you to, by your Spirit, prompt a great conversion of heart among us so that we can uh, better reflect uh, your image in the world coming to you as your trusting children, we pray in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, St. Joseph, St. Dominic, St. John Vianney. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.